Dr. Frederick Wortham, author of the controversial article, The Comics Very Funny, meets critics Edwin J. Lucas and Virgilia Peterson on The Author Meets the Critics. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Author Meets the Critics, the original radio program where outstanding authors are put to the severest test, meeting their <laughs> critics face to face. And now, meet the man who keeps the peace on these programs, your regular chairman, John K.M. McCaffrey. Whether we like it or not, the comic books have replaced Horatio Alger and the Rover Boys, and apparently it's getting serious. So serious, in fact, that a bill was introduced in the New York State Legislature last year calling for an investigation. One senator referred to comic books as, uh, quote, an obscene glorification of violence and crime, unquote. Some of our cities have taken up the cudgels against comic books. Indianapolis magazine distributors, city officials, and civic groups have banned them. Detroit police have forbidden newsstand sales. In fact, the pressure pressure on comic book publishers has been so severe that they have now adopted their own code of morality, a kind of uh, haze office for comic books. One of the leading crusaders in the campaign against the comic books has been our author of the afternoon. In May of this year, he wrote an article for the Saturday Review of Literature entitled The Comics. Very funny. And you'll find it reprinted in the current Reader's Digest. The article has started a storm of controversy, and so it was inevitable that we should invite the author to our NBC microphone. Here he is with a statement of his position, one of the country's leading psychiatrists, director of the psychiatric service of Queen's General Hospital and of the Lafargue Clinic, Dr. Frederick Wortham. Mr. McCaffrey, I am very glad that you invited a lawyer to defend the comic book publishers. They need it. My position in this discussion is an unfortunate one, for I have to appear as an advocate of the obvious. And the only thing that makes it easier for me is that a defender of comic books has to be an advocate of the absurd. The real question is this. Are comic books good or are they not good? Now, it all depends on what you want. If you want to raise a generation that is half stormtroopers and half cannon fodder with a dash of illiteracy, then comic books are good. In fact, they are perfect. It is no longer a question of what I say. The comic book publishers themselves have conceded everything I wrote in that article. One month after my article appeared in the Saturday Review of Literature, the comic book publishers issued issued a code. Sadistic torture should not be depicted Race hatred should not be created. Crime should not be glorified. Now imagine for a moment, Mr. McCaffrey, if I would issue a code. From now on, Dr. Wortham will not beat his wife. He will not get drunk every night. He will not spend all his weekends at the races and all his money. (laughs) That means I admit having done all that. Well, I'm glad you've reformed, Dr. Wortham. (laughs) Now that is exactly what this code of the comic book publishers means. But the whole code is phony anyhow. They have had codes before. Look at this comic book here. It is called Desperado, Desperado, Desperado. Three Desperado. (laughs) Now, it has a code printed right in front of it. And this code says that blood should not be shown flowing from the face of a man. And if you turn just one page, you see blood streaming from the eye of a man all over his face. Now, to show you the bad faith involved in this, I'll show you the next number of Desperado, Desperado, Desperado. (laughs) Here is the same thing. Now, what did they they do? They kept the blood and they left out the code. In other words, I contend that these publishers are characters out of their own comic books. (laughs) And now, Dr. Wortham, meet your critics. First, the executive director of the Society for the Prevention of Crime, Mr. Edwin J. Lucas, a lawyer. A lawyer by inheritance, Mr. McCaffrey, but not by practice or profession. I'm a criminologist, and no one knows that better than Dr. Wortham. My embarrassment embarrassment in opposing Dr. Wortham's article today is balanced by my delight that I've been given the opportunity to do so. He and I are old and good friends, and I hope we shall remain so, despite the fact that I say with all the emphasis at my command, that I could not disagree more violently with him than on the issue that comics significantly influence the behavior of children. I, I had hoped that we had made progress since the Middle Ages when it was believed that the evil spell of witchcraft, the impish little devils, and other absurd creatures of superstition were responsible for delinquent behavior. 
I thought we had emerged from the era of naive oversimplification on this complex subject into the enlightened conviction that crime is the end product of a series of social, economic, and deep psychological factors, complicated and often baffling in their origin. I had also thought that what drives a person into crime is uniquely personal to him, and that to prevent crime, you cannot spray all people with an ideological DDT. I had thought all these things, and I still do. And oddly enough, I think Dr. Wortham does too, because he has written just that in the past. But now he takes us back to the Middle Ages. Now it's colored pictures which cause crime. The article, the comic's very funny, is replete with half-truths, and I'm sorry I have to say this and clever tricks by which he associates some terrible crimes with comics without showing the motivating relationships, if any, between the two. He accepts, curiously enough, the self-diagnosis of a child, whereas in his professional life he knows full well this is an unreliable index to correct diagnosis. And, finally, he has not taken the pains to explain why, if comics systematically poison children's minds, as he says, such an insignificant fraction of 70 million readers of comics ever commit crime. Now, to be sure, he says these things very humorously at times. But because I think this is very dangerous dogma, I say, Dr. Wortham, not very funny. With an entirely different point of view is our other critic of the afternoon, the distinguished author, reviewer, and lecturer, Miss Virgilia Peterson. I'd much rather fight Mr. Lucas right away instead of making my statement, but I'll make it. I'm <laughs> bursting. The most con- controversial thing about Dr. Wortham's article against the comics, to me anyway, is that anyone finds it controversial. He himself said it was obvious. It seems to me to be the most obvious thing in the world. That can there really be any doubt left among American adults... I'm not speaking, of course, of the publishers of comics, that they are among the most stultifying offshoots of our whole system of stultifying, pandering for money to the lowest instincts of our youth and our adults. And where on earth is our national sense of responsibility? Dr. Wortham says 75% of the American parents don't like the comics. I'm quite sure that that's true. Why are they led by the nose? Who is leading them to give their children what they themselves consider poison? If we had arsenic wrapped up in pretty little packages and on sale for 10 cents in every drugstore, would we also buy those for the kids? I not only agree with everything that Dr. Wortham says, but I think he's left out a side which is also important, and that is that the comics are a visual defilement. They defile human appearance, human speech, as well as human behavior. The dramatist person I consists of people who look like orangutans and orangutans who look like people, children who look like mental defectives, when there are any children at all, and adolescent females who look like advertisements for underwear. The unvarying facial expressions in the comics are of fear, horror, or plain deadpan paralysis. Even the clumsy drawing and brash colors are a defilement to the eye. And as for the dialogue, as for that mixture of pseudo-genteel and downright common, horrible English, it's unspeakable. We in this country are supposed to be making an earthly paradise for our children. There's no money we don't seem to be ready to spend. No meetings we're not ready to rush and attend. Parent-teachers meetings by the score. No stone we won't unturn. And no cash we won't cough up. To improve, to change, even to revolutionize education. Or at least that's what we say about ourselves. Yet, in this particular thing, when a system we've been fighting proved to be able to brutalize and demoralize its youth by education... And we just finished fighting that system down. And we claim that we ourselves know how to govern ourselves. Now, in the name of free enterprise and perhaps free speech, we are allowing ourselves to be bamboozled into buying or letting our children buy the worst kind of propaganda that was ever launched. It seems to me that actually it's a tyranny by a handful of unscrupulous people. And if it is that kind of a tyranny, it's just as bad as the tyrannies we're afraid of on the other side of the world. Well, I I think that for the first time in many, many months, I'm going to be called upon to moderate the author meets the critics in terms of the statements which are made. So I can only say to you, Miss Peterson, and to you, Mr. Lucas, have at each other. Mr. Lucas, do you want to make any comment on Miss Peterson's statement? Well, I think Miss Peterson's statement is very well written. (laughs) I think it's very well spoken. 
I listened attentively, and I still don't know what she is saying. I gather she is saying it's bad literature. I haven't made the contention that it's good literature. I gather she is saying that it's in poor taste in some instances. I haven't made the contention, and I won't make the contention this afternoon, that it's necessarily in good taste. You better not. I'm going to confine myself to one thing and one thing only, and this seems to be the burden of what Dr. Wortham has written. And incidentally, we're discussing Dr. Wortham's article. It's this. Do the comics influence children's behavior? I say no. Miss Peterson. I have here from the Friday New York Times of August 6th an advertisement for the comics. The word emotion is written in large letters. The paragraph and the Comic Weekly published this, to which I would like to draw your attention, my dear Mr. Lucas, says, the comics are so effective in influencing people's attitudes, ideas, and opinions that they are now recognized as, in italics, one of the most powerful social forces in America today. Well, I'm not discussing, Miss Peterson, what an advertising copywriter has to say about the comics. I'm interested in what people who know something about behavior have to say about the comics. Now I'm going to refer to an authority on behavior. His name is Dr. Frederick Wortham. He wrote a book, a very, very good book indeed. But he took his time to write that book, and he devoted a good deal of thought to it. He was not being emotional. He was being coldly, scientifically expert. And when he was being coldly, scientifically expert and not emotional... He wrote language like this. The book I referred to, in case Dr. Wortham doesn't recall it, is Dark Legend, published in 1940. And discussed twice on The Author Meets the Critics. And a very good book it is. Now, it's a good book because Dr. Wortham was being very sane then. This is what he said. No human act. Now, pay heed to this, Miss Peterson. This is an expert talking. Not Ed Lucas, but Dr. Wortham. No human act, I'm quoting from page 39, exists in a vacuum. It is a part of a larger and older pattern. I want to quote another passage. I do not want to act like the microscopist, who, seeing in a specimen something he sees significant or thinks significant, immediately uses the highest magnification to study it, ignoring everything else. Now, Dr. Wortham knows full well that behavior is the result of a complex of factors of which comic books plays an almost insignificant, and I'm going to stick my neck out and say a non-existent part. Well, then, I think we should bring in our author of the afternoon, the author of the comics, very funny Dr. Frederick Wortham. Maybe my book is not so good if it can be so misunderstood. Not misread, though. Oh, misread. I read your I don't mean all the words are there. The words are there. And the thought is there, too, Dr. Wertham. Let me answer you point by point. In the first place, as far as the question of emotion is concerned, it doesn't make much difference whether one is or whether one isn't. But I am very frank to say I am partisan in this controversy. I am definitely on one side. I am on the side of the children. Now, you say... You're not for one moment suggesting, Fred Wertham, that I'm not. I spend my waking hours doing just that. In your controversy, I spend my hours... Well, let me make these few points. You talk about the Middle Ages, you see. Now, you say I'm in the Middle Ages. I reproach you from being, in eight, of being scientific in 1895. That's when Freud probably saw that these things, and I quote you now, are deep, complicated, baffling, uniquely personal. It isn't so terribly mysterious. I don't think that it is so. Now, you say I don't accept... You don't what think so now, didn't you? Wait a minute, let, 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 let Dr. Wortham come back. So this is either. first statement I accept after. very definitely what children say, and I accept what they are... Relatives say, just a very short while ago, an 11-year-old boy committed a holdup in California and killed a woman of 42. And when the police came to arrest this 11-year-old boy, his older brother, who's 20, said, if you want to know the cause of all this, here it is. It's these rotten comic books. Cut them out, and things like this would not happen. Well, I've heard this over and over again from fathers, from mothers, from children, there are any number of cases where that has happened. And I don't presume to put my own ideas in a generalization. I listen to the people, and I take for granted that what they say has some kind of meaning. This boy knew, this particular boy. Now, the other important argument you say is that what seven million readers, they don't commit delinquencies and others do. Can I give one example? 
Take tubercle bacilli. Everybody in this room has inhaled tubercle bacilli. But we don't have tuberculosis. And yet we forbid, and yet we forbid to spit in the subway. Now, uh, if we apply the yardstick of uh, uh, Mr. Lucas, then we would say there are millions of people who don't have tuberculosis, therefore let's spit in the subway as much as we can. Oh, uh -huh. I think one of them is enough. It's a odd absurdum, Dr. Wortham. You just want to spit in somebody's eye at this point. Is that right, <laughs> Mr. Lucas? No, no, I wouldn't do that with Fred Wortham. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Mr. Lucas. Now, Dr. Wortham, Fred Wortham, my good, dear friend, you accept, you accept, you say, what the children say concerning what produced their behavior. Suppose, Dr. Wortham, prior to the time that you practiced psychiatry, I came to you with a stomach ache. Would you accept my diagnosis of what that stomach ache was caused by? Of course you wouldn't. What do you mean? Very often you tell you. I go to a doctor and I tell him what I ate and the chances are that that's right. You it. tell him what you ate, but you don't tell him what you've got. I tell him I have an ache. And then now, let me quote from you again. Let me quote from you again, Fred Wortham, on page 50 of Dark Legend. I didn't have to go far. Only on page 50 I found this. One's conscious reason of what he does, for what he does, is merely a rationalization, said Dr. Wortham, of his unconscious motive. So when a child comes to you and you ask the question, have you been reading any good comic books lately? <laughs> and the child says, yes, and therefore I committed this offense, that is the last kind of criterion I would use for diagnosis. Precisely the last. Must be no different. child ever said anything like this. You see, no child ever talks like this. I tell you how it's quite different. I have just now a boy referred to me, age 14, whom I have to see tomorrow again, a boy of 14 who's accused and suspected, and in my opinion and the police opinion, guilty of having shot a boy of 13. I have to examine. He doesn't... I don't ask him, did a comic book cause it? I don't ask him that at all. I ask him, how do you spend your time? He tells me I spend a great deal of time reading comic books. I say, bring me your favorite comic book. Here it is. It's called Famous Crimes. In this book, there are 19 murders, 10 with a gun, and the other nine choking to death, stabbing in the back, beating in the face with a lead pipe, Dropping a life in a vat of acid, throttling or something or other. When hanging. did you reject the giant killer last, Dr. Wilson. Shall I... When if I am a doctor... When did you reject the giant killer last? Oh, that's a totally different thing. You can't even compare There were more murders in Jack the Giant Killer than in two of those comics you've got on your... Yes, Peterson. I have to contradict you on facts. Do you know murders before 1938 in the United States committed by children of 12, 11, 10, 9, 8... Why, of course, we Dr. Wortham, you don't. testified for two of them, as a matter of fact, in 1932. How old were they? Twelve and fourteen. I didn't testify. Anyway. Yes, you did. I've got your testimony in my office. I and are you that. trying to suggest to me yeah. that 1935, which is the date upon which, the year during which, comic books were first published in great volume, are no, you trying no, to that suggest to me... The year is wrong. The year is wrong. Thirty-four, then. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Well, Are you no, trying to suggest to me that prior to ten years ago there were no murder, murders by children? Yes, I'm trying to tell you that When did Gino commit his murder? The boy was 17. In Dark Legend. When 17. did he commit it? 1932. Yeah. Miss Peterson, would you like to come in himself. here? They're <laughs> getting on my nerves. Because <laughs> I'm... Well, don't let us, Both of them are getting on your nerves. <laughs> I'm calmer than you are, but I have got a nervous system. <laughs> Mr. Lucas, do you believe in education? More than I believe in almost anything else. And do you think that perhaps the reading matter has of youth has something to do with the education? More than I believe anything else. And the pictures they look at? Yes, but not behavior. Well, you mean to say that education has no effect on behavior? <coughs> well, now, Miss Peterson, let me tell you about that. There are some very poorly educated people in this country. Dr. Wortham sees them very often in his clinic who behave in a more socially acceptable fashion than a great many educated people I know. Are you then going against education? No, I'm not doing anything of the sort. I'm suggesting to you, however, that the causal relationship between the two is very slight. That's what I'm suggesting to you. Between comics and education or between no, education between comics, and behavior? between comics and behavior. But you're skipping a whole step there because you do not want to discuss the subject of the effect of education upon human behavior. I came here prepared to discuss, as I said, Miss Peterson, and I'm not going to let the minutes slip by by being lured into any other discussion. <laughs> I came here prepared to discuss the relationship, if any, between comics and behavior. 
And you oh, refuse you to take the subject of education. I don't call that I getting away from don't. you. You're all getting on my nerves, Dr. Wortham. May I ask a question? <laughs> Mr. Lucas, I try to understand your point as fully as I can. I would like to ask you a question. I have here in front of me a comic book called Boy Commandos, October 1948. By the way, will you explain to the audience that this is not a commercial? I would like them to spend <laughs> ten cents. <laughs> ten cents and buy Dr. Wortham, to my despair, we haven't had any commercial associated with The Author Meets the Critics in some time. Well, I advise you to get the comic book, as far as money is concerned, anyway. <laughs> Anyhow, this book, Mr. Lucas, I want to ask you something. I'll give you very briefly what I'm referring to. Here's a story which is called Swastika Over New York. It glorifies Nazis. It glorifies their uniforms. On the outside, it shows how they win. They put the other people against the wall and shoot them. At the, in the last picture, it might be said that the Nazis win, but before they do that, they are glorified in page after page. And I ask you, have you ever heard a Nazi when he had a victim in his hands and he could kill him or choke him or burn him or gas him or whatever they did? He says here in the comic book to his opponent, how are you at foils? How are you at foils? And then they have a real duel. May I summarize? In this book here, there is a vicious and vile Nazi propaganda. Do you think it makes no difference? Do you want us to wait for Meidenick? Dr. Wortham, I'm going to try to make myself a little clearer than, quite obviously, I have already done. I say to you that it depends entirely upon the kind of child that's reading a comic, or for that matter, anything else, as to whether he's going to be influenced at all. Now, I don't quote myself as an authority for that. I quote a number of others. Freud, concerning whom you spoke in a rather, in a rather curiously facetious fashion a few moments ago, is the precursor of a good deal of this thinking, thinking which you, in part, in large part, have adopted. And you adopted it particularly on page 200 of Dark Legend, when you said, and I quote, apparently antisocial impulses do not originate in fiction. When they exist... This is easily understandable. Stories are read and listened to, but it's not entirely correct to say that they have no life. A child is influenced by fiction because it fits in so well with his already existing preoccupations. Now, I make the statement to you quite flatly, Dr. Wortham, that no child, and I make this statement flatly. No child who's committed any offense since 1935, 36, or 38, whichever is the correct year, was influenced by comics in committing that act. He was influenced instead by his inner life, the inner life that you're investigating and doing very well with every day in your professional life. Miss Peterson would like to inject Why a does a life child, how does a child life. get an inner life? What is it made through, up of? Through experiences, to... through experiences... What I want to know is how in the world you can say that a child is not influenced by what it reads, whether it's comics or not. Would you say the Bible was of no influence? Would you say the saint stories were of no influence? Would you say King Arthur, Robin Hood, all the hero stories on which children used to be brought up, would you say they'd done no good, given uh, no images in a child's I mind? I say that comics have had exactly the same influence, no more nor less than Grimm's fairy tales. Well, Grimm's you know fairy tales were produced long prior to 1938. And have had a perfectly good influence in now, why have the Grimm's, mental mind. why have Grimm's fairy tales had that good influence and it comic it tales, which are fantasies and quite extraordinary fantasies, have a bad influence? Will you explain that to me, Dr. Wortham? Well, I want to ask Mr. Lucas, and I want no, to ask you, Mr. McCaffrey. If you yeah, I want to answer the question. Mr. McCaffrey, have you ever seen, and you know as much about books as anybody that I know, have you ever seen an edition of Grimm's fairy tales or of any other fairy tales that in the midst of it, of the book... Have an advertisement of a real gun, which which shoots steel darts. The only reason this they didn't is that there weren't guns in the days of Grimm's fairy tales. Wow, wow, that was. I didn't see any advertisements for crossbows either, Mister uh, Mr. Lucas. <laughs> no, but there are word pictures that are just as terrible as drawn pictures. Now I want to ask you something. I was asked a while ago whether on this day, Sunday, I would suggest that the Bible has any influence. Uh... I don't think it has a bad influence. I think it has a very good influence. But there are some stories in the Bible that have given me goose flesh. I presume that they were so designed to give you goose flesh, Mr. Lucas. <laughs> May I ask They give more? me goose flesh, too. May I say one more point in clarification of Mr. What, what am I doing? <laughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, Mr. Lucas, what was said, the, what was you say that it, this, uh, the outside influences like comic books or poverty, all kinds of other things that uh, have a bearing on the child, they have no influence, it's the inner life. In other words, the child who does something wrong, after he read it in the comic books, he must have been psychopathic in the first place. Yes, that's, yeah, that's now, what I'm suggesting. Other words, Not necessarily yeah, psychopathic. All right, but abnormal. Yes. Now, the reasoning is this. If the child breaks into a candy store, then, he's abnorm- then he does it because he's abnormal. And why is he abnormal? Because he's abnormal because he breaks into a candy store. How do you know that in the first place? Are they, are they abnormal in the cradle? To what? Where does that begin? To what begin it to? Uh, by the way, Dr. Wortham, I want to call your attention to an obvious misstatement of fact in your article. And if you want to retract it now, I think this would be as good a time as any other to retract it. <laughs> uh, it is this, and that is that the increase in delinquency is in large part caused by the increase in the publication of comic books. Misquotation. It may interest... What was it, misquotation? Misquotation. Read the article. You have it there. Well, was it, were you misquoted by the New York Times? I don't know. I only know about the Saturday Review of Literature. I only well, corrected Galley Post since, once. Since... I know, but Dr. Wortham, since the... Now, let me tell you the quotation I had in my head. Me, Dr. Wortham, but since the article has been published, you have been speaking before a great many public gatherings. No. And I'm not going to assume that both the set. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. I've been in Maine. I had a vacation. I'd love to tell you about the comic books in Maine. <laughs> Well, do you recall speaking at the Quaker service about uh, a month yes, and a half ago? I do. That's one public meeting at which you agree you spoke before you went to Maine. That's right. Yes. Now, in that article, in that speech, did you say that delinquency was increasing? What I did say is what did I you? said. No. What I said in the article, which I like to amplify here, is that the violence in delinquency has increased, and all the authorities who know something about it say that. For instance, the presiding judge Hill of the Children's Court in New York, only recently said that uh, violence has increased. Deputy Police Commissioner Nolan said that, and everybody knows it, who has something to do with that. The violence has increased. I'm going to quote from you, Dr. Wortham. Despite statistics to the contrary, which indicate that delinquency is not increasing, Dr. Wortham said that the increase of delinquency and its brutality are due to comic books. Did you say it? Well, I want to put uh, Mr. Lucas out of his misery quickly because there's an answer in the comics. It says, we're on the way to knowing what makes one man good and one man bad. And we'll find it out by doing a frontal lobal lotomy. In other words, cutting out the section of the brain that makes man's brain too active. That's the answer in the comics. Will you take that one? Well, the lobotomy was discovered long before 1938. And but it's, the comics and, are t- taking it up now. And the fact that it was indicated was... I'm sorry to have to perform an operation to remove the activity of these extraordinarily active minds, but I'm sorry, Miss Peterson and gentlemen, time's up for both the author and his critics. Here is your announcer to tell you what lies ahead on The Author Meets the Critics. Be sure to be with us next week. Now, back to John McCaffrey. Before closing, I'd like to thank Dr. Frederick Wortham for coming here today to discuss the comics, very funny, and to thank you, Mr. Edwin Lucas, and you, Miss Virgilia Peterson, for joining us. This is John McCaffrey saying good afternoon for The Author Meets the Critics. The Author Meets the Critics is produced by Martin Stone and directed by Arthur Austin. This is Lionel Rico speaking. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.